Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to our second and final day. Trust you all had a restful night. If you didn't, I can't do much about it. We'll just to ask you to fuss bait then for the but I trust that today is going to be as exciting as yesterday. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Cheryl Foxcroft. One of the senior directors at the university is going to welcome you. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. I won't stand behind the podium to welcome you, because I see my little steps not here. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome you on this last day of what looks to be a very exciting conference. I see, just looking at the list of presenters, that Presenters have come from far afield, not only locally. So I sincerely hope on this crisp morning in Port Elizabeth, you're feeling sufficiently warm to have great intellectual debates this morning. While I was looking through the program and looking at the range of topics that have been presented, I was struck by a quote I remembered from one of the earlier researchers in the field of the scholarship of teaching and learning called Lee Schulman. And he said that we need to change the status of teaching from private to public property. You know, so much of our teaching happens behind closed doors, where there are many, many innovative things taking place, but we don't always take the time to reflect on those innovations, to systematically learn about them, document them, and make them public. And that was part of what Lee was meaning when he said we must change the status of teaching from being private property to public property. And I really want to commend the researchers that are presenting at this conference because that's what you are busy doing. You're busy changing the status of teaching from being this thing that happens behind closed doors to systematically researching it, finding answers to questions, making knowledge about educational innovation available to the rest of us that are involved in the same business of teaching and learning. I hope as well that you go beyond simply presenting at the conference and publish your work because that's the final and ultimate step in making your learnings public about teaching and learning. Having had the opportunity to welcome you here this morning, I hope that I will have the same opportunity in about a year and a quarter's time. We have just heard over the last few weeks that the 2011 HALTASA conference, the Higher Education Learning and Teaching Association of South Africa, is going to be held here. So there's going to be another opportunity for you to actually come and share your work with different audiences as well. So let's hope that I'll be able to welcome a number of you back at that stage, probably end of November, beginning of December. 2011, we're still just finalising the dates. But good luck for the day and all, all those presenting today, especially good luck to you. Thank you. As Cheryl was reminded or, or reminding us that Shulman emphasised what's private should become public, suggests to me that what Jackie's doing this morning is to try to make the I become the we. So good luck, Jack. <laughs> uh, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> well, many thanks for that introduction. And uh, I just want to add my own thanks, um, in particular to Leslie, because uh, as director of the Action Research Unit, uh, she was very influential in the invitation to come to speak to you today. And it's one of the highlights of my professional year to actually come to talk with uh, an audience like yourselves. So many thanks indeed, Leslie, for this. It's a, it really is a pleasure. Um, what I was hoping to do in this keynote is to focus on two areas of transformation. And 
there's one that I think I've been emphasizing a lot um, as I have gone around the world and getting those keynotes, and that is uh, to include your own eye within the, not only the inquiry, and not only the abstract, but within the inquiry question that you actually ask yourselves. Because I think every action researcher is engaged in a, a self-study of some kind into improving their own practice, as well as trying to enhance the learning of others and possibly the social formation in which we live and work. We've got that um, emphasis on that kind of question, how do I improve what I'm doing? And so what I want to do is to just go through our programme that we've been uh, going through over the last two days and just highlight the difference between the abstracts that contain the I, your I, and the desire to improve practice. And then after some 36 presentations, I want to just ask, why is it that only eight of them have got only I, we, or me in the title? Okay, so it feels to me that we're missing an opportunity to highlight how important our own, literally, our own eye is. Not as the egotistical eye, but as the eye that is relating to others and trying to improve practice. So that's one thing I want to concentrate on. And then the other transformatory process I want to suggest that we engage in, and it may be at Altasa in 2011, quite a number of the presenters here will come with videos that include themselves in their analysis of their practice. And when I was about to start to uh, give the keynote at Peltassa in 2009, it was hilarious. I've practiced the whole night before on the internet. Some of you may have been there. I came to the, give the keynote, okay? And I pressed the button for the internet, and the internet had totally gone down, right? So, and my whole presentation rested on the resources that I was due to give. Ten minutes after my keynote due to finish, it came on again. So I just, to, I just pushed my luck. What I was going to do was, I, whilst it was still working here, I thought I'd just show you something uh, about the internet, which I was going to do towards the end, but I didn't want to risk waiting 30 minutes, because I think it's, uh, it's up and running at the moment. So I'd just like to start um, by showing you the uh, resources on the internet. And then just talking a little about the second process of transformation that I want to talk about, which is linked to something everybody was experiencing yesterday, I think. <laughs> and that is the energy and the values that the presenters were expressing in their actual presentations. So they had the abstracts, uh, they had papers, but the most significant part of the communication, in my judgment, was, for example, when Mikhail, Mikhail, Right, now, Mikhail brought portfolios which he's never made public before of his students. And as he was speaking, I could feel the love and the care that it, Mikhail was expressing in relation to what his students had accomplished. And what I'm really wanting to encourage is, as I've got this video now on myself, the reason that I want to look at what happens is, as I'm thinking and relating to Mikhail, you're, you have, are evoking the energy and the pleasure that I saw in you as you presented. And I think that the video will then show me some of those qualities. When Linda was here in this space, and suddenly the audience at the end said, would you please dance this? Because Linda had actually talked about the flamenco and working with dance with her students. And Linda actually performed the dance in the flamenco and showing the expressions of her pupils and herself. And the applause at the end was remarkably higher than anything else that I've heard in the conference. Right. So those of us who were present, I think will know the power of the embodied expression of Linda's movements and what was being communicated physically through the dance. So what I'm hoping, in terms of transforming the nature of the knowledge that we've got, is that Linda, over the next year or so, will actually have some videos of her dance and the communication that was coming through that real tremendous energy and the love for the dance that you portrayed yesterday. So that is what I'm suggesting in terms of the second area of transformation that we actually focus on. Now I want to give some examples from the Cell Study Conference that I was at a fortnight ago as the eighth international conference of the American Education Research Association Special Interest Group. And then I want to just point to what is happening uh, in about 10 days in Australia with the Eighth World Congress on Action Learning and Action Research. And I've been conducting a global dialogue. I was asked by the organisers if I could do this. 
And they sent me every title and abstract in one of the, what they call the streams, education and learning stream. And I just want to point to the fact that in all of the titles, there is no I, we, or me. Now, this is a puzzle to me, because this organisation has been going 20 years. It's focused on action learning and action research. Right at the heart of the process of action research is a self-study of one's own practice in relation to others and the society in which we're in. And yet, every one of these is somehow, and I think it is a cultural pressure, which conforms to the traditional form of scholarship, which takes out, I think, of the title, the transformatory potential of including the I, we, or me. But I want to come back to that, and then just to engage with the programme that we've got here, because I do think these programmes are really important, just to highlight the issue of placing one's own I within the inquiry and put it in as um, the title. But let me just, so I don't lose this opportunity just to show you uh, some of the resources that are available on the web. Now, could I just ask, how many uh, you have um, been into actionresearch.net? Could I do? That's great. Quite a number of you. Now, what I want to do is just show you these resources that are freely available for us in terms of these kinds of inquiries which I've been promoting. Now, in the Living Theory section, you'll see that some of the 30 doctoral theses and programs that I've supervised to completion over the last uh, 11 years, I've put them all on here, okay, so you can actually access those. Now, the latest one, I have nothing to do with. The latest Living Theory one came from Canada, from Quebec, and it's a head teacher, it's called Marianne Lothian. And Marianne, three weeks ago, sent me her doctoral thesis and asked if I would put it on my website, saying that this is a living theory thesis. It's the first one that has been um, legitimated at McGill University. And you'll see the title, How Can I Improve My Practice to Enhance the Teaching of Literacy? Okay, so it's that issue of how can I improve my practice? And then the uniqueness of the inquiry to enhance the teaching of literacy. Again, if you just go down a few of the other, some don't have I in this one, how do I improve my practice as an inclusion officer working in a children's service? And that was a master's dissertation that gained a merit, as it was put in last year, the very first new <coughs> theory thesis for Bath Spa <coughs> University, and that is a multimedia presentation, the very first that had included the videos of the practitioner researcher to make a point about her embodied values that she was expressing in practice. Now, the point about these is that you can actually um, click on the dissertations and you can bring up uh, the whole thesis. So, there you've got all the acknowledgements, the abstract, the ethical issues, the abstract, um, I've been contributing to educational knowledge by using a living theory methodology for exploring the implications of questions such as how do I improve my practice? Now, Chris had supervisors at her university who had no experience of supervising action research or living theory. And I think some of you, certainly in the workshop on Wednesday, were saying, what do we do when we want to do the action research, but our supervisors have not only no experience of doing action research, they themselves are traditional researchers. Now this was Chris's position, but she was able to draw on discussions with myself and others, and she had the confidence to say, well, my question really is, how do I improve my practice as inclusion officer? And what she did was she worked over a period of six months. This was 18 months into her dissertation, so six months in terms of producing a living theory <coughs> dissertation that she felt confident in, and then she gave that draft to her supervisor, rather than expecting her supervisor to be able to supervise it. Am I, am I making sense here? Because some of you will be in these positions. So I think you just need to search out people around the world who can actually help you uh, with your inquiries. <coughs> even though your supervisors may not directly have actually conducted this kind of work. Now, the way you can actually do this, in terms of connecting in to other people that have um, the experience of the supervision, is to go into this section here, what's new, 
in the 2009-10 academic year. Now, if you just go down here, you'll see that I put my keynotes for this session here. So you'll be able to access those directly. You can go down and there are all the details about the Eighth World Congress in the beginning of September. But what I want to show you is this particular <coughs> statement here. To join or leave the 2009-10, this will now become 10-11 Practitioner Researcher e-Seminar. Now, this one here that you can actually access, just by clicking on that, you can put your own name and email in here, submit it, and you've joined a global dialogue on practitioner research. Now, I do hope some of you will feel that you'd like to join in that, because it means that you can actually access the archives of a global conversation that is going on in terms of the researchers like yourself who are wanting to talk and communicate with each other. And you can link in with all of the back conversations. And this, by the way, is called JISC Mail, and every academic in the United Kingdom have access to it freely. We can create these forums freely. And I was saying that if you can't do that here, I can easily, for example, for Leslie, if she finds that she can't actually create one, I can literally do it in minutes in the UK. It could be under NMMU as a practitioner researcher group. You can actually then contribute to it. Now, just in August, you'll see that uh, you can go through the conversations that have been going on. And I do think there's a woman, and I <coughs> wouldn't even know her surname, but, in fact, isn't Aretha here? Yeah. Okay, so... I'm going to match it, so don't use me as an example. I recently joined. And that's just by chance. So the very first person, August the 1st, that's Aretha, who is here. And you'll be able to see that the kind of... If we go down, so coming to some of the latest ones, <coughs> but this is... Susan Goff is the president of the... Uh, World uh, Association, that is the Action Learning Action Research Association. She's organizing the World Congress in 10 days' time. Alan Mankovitz at a college in Saint, uh, New York. Alan's got a director of research programs. He's got action research within all of the graduate programs of his college. But do you just get a sense? You see, this is how you would just access them. Sarah, as her, this would be uh, her introduction. She just joined. But I hope you just get the sense about something that you can actually join now. The conversations like this woman here, Sarah Sayers, has been very stimulating. She joined a few uh, weeks ago. She has just got right to the heart of action research. Her postings are so authentic in terms of the issues she's facing, and she's getting a lot of responses in the seminar around <coughs> the world that she says is really stimulating her. But it was just whilst I had and I know that I've got this access to the internet, I just wanted to show you those so that you do know that you can join a practitioner researcher network and actually participate and share ideas and that you can actually keep this record and do possibly what, and there's Chris, Chris did it, because, Chris, because what Chris did yesterday was really inspiring about blogs. And again, I'm hoping that Chris will video the kind of presentation he gave yesterday because it was one of the most remarkable demonstrations of how to use blogs and actually create a report very easily and very simply in a very ordered way using blogs and visual media to actually communicate what it is that we're doing in our action research. So I think there was something, as I said yesterday, which was really creative and highly significant to what we're doing. But I'm just hoping that you've got a sense about, first of all, that practitioner researcher uh, network that you can actually get into. And I, what I want, also want to just show you is there is a section here of the home pages of interest. And when you go into this, you'll be able to um, find information about this diverse conference, Dublin City University in June next year. And this is an opportunity with Maggie Farron at Dublin City University <coughs> to develop some of the multimedia resources that you might be encouraged to develop through this keynote. I hope you are. But you'll just see that in these other home pages, you've got access to the Collaborative Action Research Network, 
The, this is the Action Learning Action Research Association. This is the World Congress one in 10 days. <coughs> Here's your own, the Action Research Unit in the Nelson Mandela, Director Leslie. A peer-reviewed online journal, Inquiry and Education. So I'm hoping you just see in these other home pages uh, that you can actually access such a wide range of resource around the world that is just freely accessible for you. And what Jean couldn't show you yesterday, because Jean hadn't got the access to the net, is the range of resource that Jean has, has made available in terms of the theses, the action research theses, uh, publications that Jean has actually got with her books, uh, some of our joint publications, that are, again, all the details are freely available on Jean's website. So you'll see that resources which are literally freely available for you are downloadable at the touch of a button. You click, you can access. The theses that Jean has been supervising to successful completion. Now, these are all here for you to actually download and use. Look at Bernie Sullivan's Living Theory of a Practice of Social Justice. So the living theory contains Bernie's eye. That is her explanation for her influence. You click, you can download. Again, Catriona MacDonald, the Again, social justice. How do I enable primary school? Now it's that one. Primary school children with specific learning disabilities and myself as their teacher to realize our learning potential. And again, the resource is available freely. It's on Jean's website. And you'll just see, as I say, how rich this is. And there, look at that one. How can I improve my practice so as to help my pupils to philosophize? So you'll see, as I said, you're simply not alone in having the courage to put your own eye within your inquiry title, to actually communicate that it is your living theory based on your values, and each person here has a unique constellation of values, so that you can bring these into the academy, not subsuming your own embodied knowledge with anybody else's theory. You know, so I'm hoping in this keynote that you really are feeling that your own eye is vitally important. The embodied knowledge that you have brought into this conference and expressed is what I'm saying we need to focus on in making it public to transform what counts as educational knowledge around the world. But nobody in their presentations were videotaping. There was one, I think, with Linda's. Somebody had a, mobile, a phone, and I think they were filming uh, as you were dancing. So I'm just hoping that we've got that episode, because I think it will give so much in terms of the life and vitality of the expression of the values that we can then make public. So I'm really hoping. Did who video? Did anybody video Linda? Because that is so, you did. That's really great. Yeah. So at some point, I'm hoping we can actually get that on the web, probably through YouTube, and we can you know, just look at what we experienced yesterday to enhance the meanings of the energy and the values, which Linda could in no way just get in a written paper. She had to enact it. We had to feel and see the expression of that energy with values. And what I'm hoping that, even as I'm saying what I'm saying now, I'm actually reliving that experience. I can actually feel and see it. And I'm hoping the video is picking that expression of that energy up with me so I can actually say, look, this is the quality of energy and value that I think we bring into our educational practice. But we need to find a way of making it public. Now, let me just pause there, because I just want to ask whether I'm actually, if you like, making sense about what I'm actually saying here, about your own eye and this idea of the transformation in terms of this embodied value and energy of yours through multimedia. Because I, I do want to just pause, because I don't want just to talk at you for the 45 minutes. So just let me pause and just say, has anything uh, been evoked in what I'm saying, or do you want to actually just question anything, or even something that came up yesterday, you're thinking, yes, I hope Jack uh, really relates to this, because I'd like to go and leave the conference feeling that this kind of question has been answered. So I, I do just want to pause there. Yes? I'm not an actual searcher, but I think we, we tend to avoid using eyes and knees and mice in traditional language because we think that that's not really the right 
I dull the eye and the knee and the knee in my writing and in my research as well. So, yeah. just a comment. Yeah, yeah. And it was so powerfully influenced by my first degree in science. I was taught in my first degree to remove the I from every one of my accounts. So it took me two to three years to have the confidence to say, actually, it's that kind of physical science or the Arakiri cultural botany paradigm that is mistaken. You know, and yet, Deirdre, where's Deirdre? Deirdre, Deirdre. I was just talking with Deirdre about um, why the I in terms of the title had seemed to me to have got transformed into teacher or teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think, Deirdre, you said, didn't you, that you'd been under some pressure to remove the I. Mm -hmm. That could clear as maybe remove the we yeah. from my question. Okay. And in replacing it, I found it didn't actually embody what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I replaced it with teachers of technology education and consumer studies. But that isn't it, as, um, as Jack pointed out. But the, but the we is, is what the participatory action, you know, I'm doing it with my students. The whole argument that I've done in my thesis is that I, or teachers, cannot do this. It's impossible, there are barriers um, stopping us from influencing teenage food choices. So therefore, it can't be me, and it can't, it, it, it can only be me. It can only be put together. So the we has to be actually there, so I'm going to resubmit to the ethics committee a motivation why I think the we must go back before I actually write up my thesis. And you see, the other point is so vital I, in terms of what I'm advocating because I think everybody in this room is under enormous cultural pressure. It's got a historical and economic base, but a real tremendous cultural pressure to remove the I, the we and the me, from our inquiries. Now, in 91, I was being paid, the University of Bath was being paid by Kingston University uh, for me to act as a consultant to develop action research. But the ethics committee and the research committee at Kingston were made up solely of engineers and scientists. So one of my uh, students who was a head teacher put in hers, how do I improve my practice as a head teacher? A letter came back requiring the personal pronoun I to be removed from the inquiry before the committee would permit it to go forward. Now, can you see how nonsensical that is? An action research inquiry involving how do I improve what I'm doing, how do we improve what I'm doing, and the committee say, take your eye out of it. <coughs> now, we made that committee look foolish, okay? Now, they, they had to rescind it, and the teacher was allowed to conduct the inquiry. But you're going to be faced with, I think, a lot of that kind of pressure. Now, look at the World Congress titles. Here they are. Now, I'll just quickly go through these, and you'll see these. These are all in the address I put on the web. Okay, interrogating privileged subjectivities, tensions and dilemmas in writing reflected personal accounts of privilege, empowering teachers to curriculum change, an action research approach. <coughs> yeah, now I can go through every one of these. You see, involving young people as partners in research. So every one of those, not one of them, has got the I, the we, or the me in. Now, I don't believe that's a coincidence. Do you? That when I saw um, Mikhail's presentation, I looked very carefully at his title and his abstract. Now, actually, Mikhail, have you got your programs here? Could you just turn um, just to Mikhail? It's on page 12. And I've done a couple of these in my keynote, so you can just see how I've responded to your titles and then your abstracts. Now, how Mikhail has actually given his title is Reflections Along the Way, Learning Life Skills and Photojournalism on the Streets of Durban. So this is page 12. Are you all okay with this? Now, if you just go down to the second paragraph, Mikhail, this is the claim. In this paper, I will show how action research in the photojournalism course at Durban <coughs> University of Technology contributes to the living... Have you got this? Yeah? Experience of first-year students so they will be quick for success in the highly specialised field of photojournalism. Now, if you just keep looking at that and just see if you can form a question which keeps Mikhail's eye in the question, doesn't eliminate it. Okay? Now, 
What I came up with last night as I was reflecting on this, and I've done this also for <coughs> Linda and Tobika, because I think your own eyes are vital in terms of your communication. Now, you'll see that in the title, Reflections Along the Way, Learning Life Skills, Mikhail's eye at the moment isn't there. Yet, Mikhail was absolutely vital for his presentation. I don't believe anybody in this room could have actually helped the students to produce what Mikhail produced actually in that really creative and original <laughs> development of the portfolios. So, what I've just suggested is that where Mikhail has, uh, has said in this paper, I will show how action research, okay, so the subject there becomes the action research. Am I making sense here and not Mikhail? Yes. Now, if you then go to this, how do I enhance my contribution to the process of equipping students for success in photojournalism using action research in the photojournalism course, you've actually transformed the nature of the title into the question that Mikhail can embrace himself and his influence <coughs> in terms of his use of action research in equipping the students for success in photojournalism. Now, what I'm suggesting in those 36, I think it is, uh, presentations, only eight have got I, my, or we in the title, that you, you just practice over the next week or so and I've done it with three in my keynote that you can access, just to see what it feels like to you to retain the eye, to retain your eye in terms of enhancing your influence in practice, in terms of your inquiry. <coughs> but knowing that you will have cultural and socio-political pressures of the research communities, the ethics communities, in your universities and also the journals, to remove the eye. And Deirdre, that was, a, you know, that was a lovely illustration of what I was saying as we were just talking yesterday. Because I was curious about why Deirdre's eye wasn't there. She said, well, I've been under pressure to take it out. Is the we. Yeah? Now, what I'd like to make sure is that those pressures that we're all under are really understood. Because in my keynote that's on the web, you'll see that every title for the World Congress in the Action and Learning Strand has gone back into the traditional form of propositional knowing. It's the traditional form of scholarship that you form titles in terms of abstract generalities. Like, <coughs> it comes like all teachers, a particular course. <coughs> and I think, I'm hoping you'll resist that. I know sometimes you can't, because the power of the committees is so strong. But remember this in terms of your academic freedom. But Jeff Sutherman Gladwell at Brock University I mentioned this at the workshop on Wednesday, was faced with an ethics committee that said he couldn't do this research in the classroom with the children. And it was actually a self-study. So he was being refused permission to engage in a self-study of his own practice. Now, Jeff was actually outraged, but he couldn't do anything about it because the university had refused him permission. But what he could do on the grounds of academic freedom was study the unethical behavior of the ethics committee in, in banning him from doing this research. Now, he had the courage to do this, and his master's dissertation went through. I put it on the web in the values section, and you can just uh, look at some of those pressures that I think you will be under to keep your own eye, or the we that you're working with, or my, within your title of your inquiry. Are we okay with this, just at the moment, that, that this is clear and you can get the evidence, you know, to show what I'm talking about? Now, before I go on, how long have I got? Could I just ask? I have it 15 to 18 minutes. <coughs> that's great, that's great. Now, is there anything else before I just go on to show you how I think every one of you... Yes? Um, I think that uh, I'm hearing you, Jake. And I, I am one of those who didn't put I in my title. I think what I'm... For me, my response to you would be yes. Not yes, but yes, and. Why wasn't there an I in my title? Was that for me, action research, if you move from the particular to the general as well, and I think that was, had a lot to do with Omar's point yesterday. Was it Omar? Yeah. About where does the theory come in? So for me, in my title was my conclusion, were my findings, and I tried to speak to as many academics as possible. So my title was there for one where um, I invite anyone in academia to actually think, oh, that, that's interesting. So the methodology doesn't necessarily have to come 
in the title. And there are, and there's another point, I think, is that uh, there's some very interesting recent articles in the Journal of Philosophy of Education about, and uh, that express a concern about some autobiographical research that is self-indulgent, that is sentimental. Yeah, so there's, there, there are two things. And I don't necessarily want to go into that, but I think there is a, it's a caution there yeah. that we can stay too much with the eye. And following on from there, Deirdre's point about collaborative nature of inquiry. And I think a lot of academia is very individualistic. And I think it's also important to actually show that inquiries are, that you are never an I, you're always more than an I. And the last point I want to make is a fantastic article by Basile where he queries the epistemological sort of access to knowledge through the I, the first person. Well, he says, yes, there is a route into creating knowledge, but we always have to be very cautious there, because just as much as our emotions can deceive us, which is Nussbaum's point, there is also how do we actually in memorizing or remembering our experiences that is actually a truthful reconstruction of the past. So just some, some you know, there, there are reasons why people don't put eyes on their titles. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, yes, go on. Is it Bill? Or? That's it. At the back, thank okay. you. Is it Jeff? Will you finish, Jeff? Okay, look. I could go on literally for an hour responding to that because I think those are so superb, those questions. But let me just very quickly respond to this point about making uh, generalised uh, responses in a conclusion. Now, one of the difficulties here is this, that when I was being taught by uh, the philosophers of the British Analytic School, that what they did was to remove my eye and the practical principles that I use to explain my educational influences in their belief that educational theory was constituted by the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education. And it was this move into generalizability that Richard Peters, one of the key philosophers of the day, would ask, what ought I to do? Let's explore the implications of what ought I to do. But the I was not a real living I. The I was an abstract concept, person. And explicitly, they believed that my practical principles, the principles I'm expressing now, and everybody here expressed in the presentations, now, quote, were at best pragmatic maxims having a loose and superficial justification in practice that would be replaced in any rationally developed theory by the principles from the disciplines of education. Now, am I making sense there? That the whole process of generalizability was actually to enable the teacher-researcher to conform their language to the theories of the day. You know, if they wish to make some kind of general conclusion, they had to put it within one of the existing theories of the day. Now, this is something you've got to be very careful of in relation to action research. Um, I, I'm not sure about the presentation. Uh, Herman's theory. Did somebody use this theory of personality. Yeah. <laughs> now, actually, this happened in one of the sessions, and it was a really good session. <coughs> However, it was Herman's theory that dominated the analysis. You, am I making sense here? Not, and not the living theory of the researcher. Mm -hmm. That one of the difficulties here, and you've got to be very careful here, is to work out what you're testing. Because my master's degree was in the psychology of education. And I was wanting it to help me improve my practice in the classroom with the kids. But what I found under the influence of my tutors, that I ended up testing the validity of Piagetti and cognitive stage theory and Bloom's taxonomy. Because that was where the psychologists were coming from. They had no interest whatsoever in whether my psychology was helping me to improve the learning of my children. Now, you've got to work out here where your generalizability is going to be placed. Are you going to place it within the traditional theory of the academy? Or are you going to actually do something which is actually not in the traditional sense generalizable and show what it is that you have learned and explain that in your own living theory? Now, on my website, you can see the evidence and Jean's website in particular that ideas have traveled around the world. They're not generalizable in the traditional sense of the theory, but they have actually had some universalizing influence in the way that the ideas have been taken up and acknowledged in the process of the other individual creating their own living theory. 
So I think that those points that you were raising were really crucially important in terms of um, making sure, for, in my language, that your own living theories are not subsumed by any other theory. And yet you can draw insights from those. And the philosophers, in my experience, have been one of them. And this is so difficult, this, because I got such a lot from my philosophy course. And yet they were so damaging in terms of eliminating the embodied knowledge of the practitioner from the discourse. Because they just viewed it as the first crude and superficial. Those were their words. That my knowledge, you know, the, that I was with my and yours as well, with your students, had only this first crude and superficial justification in practice. So let, what I'd like to do, uh, Joe, and we can come back. I'd love to talk more about your questions there, because I think they are so vital here. And the eye of the eye, and bringing Habermas as criteria of validity to check the validity of your accounts, where all you need to do is to submit your account to a validation group of five or six peers and ask these questions. Is it comprehensible? Have I got sufficient evidence to back up my claims that I know what I'm doing? This is one that very few researchers ask. So his third criteria, have I shown an awareness of the normative background from which I'm speaking? And what he means by that is that you're all subject to cultural, political, and social influences in what it is that you're doing and claiming. Have you shown your understanding of those normative influences? And his fourth one, which is exciting for me, it's about authenticity, and he says that you can only show the authenticity of what you're doing in relation to the values you hold over interaction over time. But there's no way I think you might be able to judge my authenticity just from this moment together. You'd have to see some of the years of practice that I've actually put in to see I genuinely sustain my commitment to the values I claim to hold. Now, if you'll go through those four criteria, and you'll see those again on my website and Jean's website, I think it will help you with validity. Now, is it, is it okay to, just to move on, because I wanted to show you just this multimedia work that I think you could all bring into your practice. <coughs> now, I'm not going to show this clip of me. You can access it from the keynote directly from YouTube. It was a moment when I'd been uh, subject to the pressure not to publish okay, my research in the university. It's this kind of pressure I'm talking about. And somebody had discovered a letter which they claimed was prima facie evidence of a breach of my academic freedom. They put it into a university board of studies. They put it into Senate. Senate agreed by a one-vote majority that there was evidence my academic freedom had been breached and the committee was set up to look into it. The committee reported, and the conclusion was a big, thick document, that my academic freedom had not been breached. Okay, that, that was the conclusion. And I agreed with it because it hadn't. Now, here I'm reenacting my meeting of the committee that invited me to look at the draft. And I felt totally defeated because whilst my academic freedom had not been breached, it had been at a great cost in terms of years of pressure that I had been under, like, take the eye out. You, you can't have the wing. Yep. We don't want you to publish this. Now, at that, I'd gone to the door, I got up from this committee feeling totally humiliated and defeated. Something happened as I got to the door, and I just felt this surge of energy. And I turned round and I faced the committee, and this video clip I put onto YouTube is my enactment of a very brief but very powerful statement that I made to that committee. And I can even feel it now as I'm speaking to you, that I said, that if they had allowed that report to go to Senate in that way, they were denying their responsibility as academics. Because I had been subjected to enormous pressures during my time at the university, and whilst I hadn't permitted them to constrain my academic freedom, they, the committee actually responded with this phrase, that it was because of Mr. Whitehead's persistence in the face of pressure that had actually made his lack of constraint possible. So they changed the conclusion, Mr. Whitehead's yeah, academic freedom not being breached, to the recognition that I had been subject to pressure, which they said a less determined individual would have been constrained by. Now this video clip is me expressing that, and you'll feel, I think, the controlled anger that was there. You? Now, it's this kind of representation that I'm saying I think we need to learn how to bring into our accounts. Now, what I've also done in the keynote is to show you how two women, Nancy Brown and Jill Farrell, presenting 10 days ago, 
are now doing this in their own work. And what I've done in the keynote is to put the video clips of Jill and Nancy. Jill's on the left, Nancy on the right. And I contrasted their presentation because is, is Han Lee here? Han Lee? Is that right? Yeah, Han Lee. Now, I saw Han Lee present yesterday, and Han Lee, it was one of the energies, like with Linda, that Han Lee has a gaze very much like Jill here. Now, Jill holds you with an amazing power of her gaze. You, you're under no doubt that you are a value to Jill in terms of the gaze. Hanley was communicating that to a whole room through her enactment and her bodily presence and the way that that was brought in to those relationships was amazingly powerful. Now I'm saying, and I said to Hanley, look, I think there is a way in which you could bring that into your account because if you miss it, something vital is being omitted. And the, the, what I've done with Jill and Nancy here, this is about 10 days ago, I, with that permission, videotaped them and I was able to show both of them that what they were expressing, do you see, that Jill here had no idea of this powerful gaze that she actually presented with her audience. Nancy, totally different to Jill, but Nancy had this wonderful presence of an embrace, like a space like this. It, as I say, I keep going back to Linda's because everybody was so entranced with what it was that was being communicated that Nancy has this ability as well to be in a space and you can feel literally a loving warmth of humanity. Now, Nancy, as she saw what I showed her with the videos, recognized in herself that she was expressing something that she herself felt was her loving warmth of humanity. And in her next paper, I believe that you'll find that she'll be using that expression to describe these values and energy of her own. Now, I'm saying that everybody in this room can actually bring this kind of data into their account. Now, I just want to show you just something here, because this is from the session itself. <coughs> 54 minutes. Now, as I do this, now that just takes about two or three seconds. 54 minutes, quick time movie. Now, just look at the nonverbal communications. Not the words. Just look at, just look at Jim. I mean, it's, it's like a maniac. You know, I had to say to Jim, look, Jim, you know, the quality of your gaze is unbelievable. You know, and it literally is in silence. You, you can feel, you know, real intense engagement with you and a value. But Jim speaks like a machine gun. You know, it, it's amazingly fast. And I think you can sense that in terms of the, the body language. Can you see what went on? Okay? Now, <laughs> now, the point is that we miss any of this from our representations at the moment. That what is motivating, what is energizing, is coming, if you like, from within. But there is, in my understanding, a, and this is where spirituality is often very important, a sense of an energy which is definitely coming from outside oneself which can flow through us, which we feel is life-affirming and life-enhancing. And that feels to be very important indeed to actually acknowledge. Well, whatever your spiritual ground and base, I'll guarantee that for almost everybody in this room, whether it's humanist, whether it's actually Muslim, whether it's Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, there will be that kind of spiritual energy which you feel is important and motivating. And you can bring that into your accounts in the way that I hope you'll see that... Um, I've shown in this keynote, as I said, that I'm just hoping that you will access from my web space and contrast this kind of data with Jill and Nancy's statement. Because what I've done is I've included the traditional scholarly paper that was in the proceedings of this international conference. Okay, so you can have a look at that. Then contrast the video clips with their conclusion. So this is the way they put their conclusion. Not referring at all to that embodied energy. <coughs> but they say here, those of us who understand the possibilities of teaching must get out of our own way and develop expanded professional identities that incorporate and grow through a web-based culture. 
Now, until they'd seen themselves, and this was after their presentation, which I videoed, they hadn't an understanding of their own expanded professional identity that could include their expressions of, in Jill's case, this amazing gaze. And it's like this guy called Fukuyama who had this history, it was the end of history in The Last Man, and he talked about Hegel's notion of recognition and the recognition of the other as being one of the most profoundly important human experiences. Now, Fukuyama refers to that as the thymotic relationship, going back to the Greeks. But I think everybody here will recognize the importance of that quality of relationship with another within which you feel truly recognized, and you feel that energy actually being expressed with another. Now, until they'd seen the video, neither of them had an idea that they could show a development of their own expanded professional identity using the multimedia to communicate what they themselves were feeling, and Nancy in particular, with that sense of her presence, of a loving warmth of humanity, had never thought <coughs> of bringing that into her account. Now, what I've tried to do, as I say, in the keynote, is just highlight to show how, in fact, you can actually do that. And I've said that during yesterday's presentation, I was struck, in my language, life-affirming energy and the relational qualities expressed by Liz. Where's Liz? Is Liz here? Yeah, that Liz, the way that you were actually here presenting, that again, it was Liz's energy and the values that were being expressed, and her movement was communicating something that the words themselves couldn't express. And this is why I do think if you could video some of that, as you're just expressing yourself as you did so naturally yesterday, I think it would help to transform the nature of the knowledge you're bringing into the academy. And that is the same with Han Lee, I, I said there, and particularly, <coughs> it's Faisal here, Faisal. Now, Faisal, it was so powerful, this. Now, Faisal uh, presented, are we still okay? Yeah. Faisal, understanding informal settlements in Durban, gardeners and domestic workers from the slums graduating from the University of Lyon. Now, Faisal, it was rather like Nancy with that loving warmth of humanity. Faisal's presence was, in my experience, embracing. It was not constraining. I didn't feel oppressed. I felt really invited into a social space where Faisal was deeply, profoundly committed to issues of social justice with some of the most poverty-stricken and deprived people within this arena, say, within Durban's area. Now, Faisal, in his written work and abstract, clearly, on a paper, it couldn't get close to actually communicating that powerful sense of a way of being which has got social justice as its heart. Not on a page of text, but in Faisal's way of life, his form of being. So, Faisal, I'm just saying, I hope you will find the time to just repeat that presentation at Durban University of Technology. Let us try and get it on the web, because you brought in such a profound commitment with energy and values that I think will inspire many. But I'm hoping that this idea of transforming the knowledge base is communicating with everybody here. That I think you need, or not you need, but the profession needs, <coughs> the global community needs, your accounts so that you can extend your influence of your energy and your values. Now, I know there's a very large group from the self-study for transformative higher education and social action of Durban University of Technology. Now, what has struck me over the nine months that I've been familiar with your work is the evolving nature of your knowledge in the sense of the presentations. In November, I don't believe that any of you could have actually presented in the way that you've done at this conference. Your learning has been remarkable. Now, just think of the Heltasa conference, which will be coming here in 2011. Because it feels to me that if the growth of your abilities to communicate your knowledge <coughs> continues in this way, you will have the transformatory knowledge base for Heltasa, which will be able to influence not just the South African context, but also a global context. So I'm just hoping that what I've been saying today about the importance of inclusion in the eye, make sure that you've got that energy, that life-affirming energy, and the values expressed, and this is why I think the video is really important, because you've evoked this in me. You know, I, I hope you're feeling my energy. 
because <laughs> you, know, you are evoking that now. You know, just looking at Faisal at the back, I, I, I just recall how powerfully he influenced me and brought me into as a real sense of a passion for social justice and to see how important it is to work in those poor communities to help with that value of social justice. So I just want to end in a way, in the way that I, I began, just by, first of all, thanking the organisers of Leslie, but also yourselves, because I hope you can feel that what I'm taking away is your energy and values that will be inspiring me to continue what I do. So I just want to thank you all very much indeed for that pleasure and privilege. So thank you. As always, very inspiring talk. Thank you so much. I think your sincerity, your authenticity really came through. A very comprehensible way that we all understood it. And I'm sure it's really influenced my thinking. And I hope that it's, I know it's going to influence a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's really good. Thank you. Well, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if the next conference there will be a lot more dancing and soccer. <laughs> Can I suggest we take a two minute leg stretch and then Professor Bill Holness will now be taking over to chair the next uh, four presentations. Can we watch the clock and start at 9.35 and we'll just steal five minutes. Thank you very much. Is that okay, Bill? is that the written word has been such limitation or that the opportunities that the modern technologies have afforded us to bring another form of representation which is the, the embodiment as an image maybe. Um, when, you, when you train as a scientist and what you are arguing so strongly is that we objectify of what we do in science. It is. Um, so there's this tension always, isn't there? There is. Between, well, just look how you're communicating now. Yeah. It feels warm, it feels yeah. open. Yes. You know, and you think, right, look, this is what educational relationships yeah? well, I think if I go down deep, I don't know if this is where you come from, but what I go down deep is that even our systems within society objectify all of us. So we just simply become elements in a system. And to keep the, the person and the eye present, I, mean, I think that's the huge challenge. Uh, and yet we will always need systems. Yeah. Uh, it, I think Eric Fromm, for me as a theoretician, did it better than anybody. Um, he, he had man for himself, fear of freedom, in the 1940s. Yes. Who was that? It's, he's a humanistic Who? psychologist called Eric Fromm. F-R-O-M-M. -M. It's Tillich, I thought Tillich was on. And I think, oh yes, Tillich. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, but that, that is from the thing about the objectification yes. through the capitalist system. Yes. Okay, so we're all become marketing personalities. That's the pressure. Right. And his point is about how do we retain this quality of humanity? Yes. Uh, knowing that that pressure's there. Yeah. And it's there all the time. Yeah. I mean, we can't escape it. We're in it. Yeah, yeah we always almost say self promoting is, is that pressure. Mm. So I'm just hoping it helps. Your reference to spirituality, I think, is one of the, the key areas, is you have to have a something greater than yourself, yeah. outside of yourself, that is normative uh, and that is also life empowering. Mm. And also because I think the most exciting thing to me is to suddenly say, hey, I'm okay. It is. No, that is it. Yeah. You know? yeah. That is really it. Actually, yeah, I am, I am influencing. Okay. Yeah. Because so many times the system seems to want to put you down because of other people's insecurities. Mm -hmm. I or the pathologies. They're in within in the system, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. No, it's such a those, um, group, isn't it? No. Oh. The energy, I don't totally agree with that. Those um, Alara papers that you mentioned, the one curriculum development, they 
do some research? Are they accessible on your web? Uh, or how yeah, would I get yeah. me to get into Lara? No, the, the abstracts are available on the web. The papers aren't being delivered until the second uh, of uh, September. So I, I can put you in touch with it. Please. Yeah. Because I've got me right to Yeah, no, I've got, I've got all the emails as well on there, so I think you'll be able to contact whoever you want and ask for the paper. So you can do it with a way to write it on your time code. Yeah, that'd be good to come. I'll find it with you. Well, thanks for this opportunity. Yeah, really yeah.